Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Holistic Health Radio. I'm your host, Sarah Liz King. I'm an exercise physiologist and health coach, empowering you to find your healthy balance with food, fitness, and your body. Through my one to one and group coaching programs, both myself and my team help women regain their periods, find food freedom, and have a healthier relationship with exercise, all while gaining body confidence. Big welcome back to the show, Elise. Hi, thank you. And emotional support puppy is here as always, Henry Dean having a little nap. Uh, And today we are going to be sharing our top five tips for exercise for hypothalamic amenorrhea recovery. This is our theme of basically like 30 days of 30 tips for hypothalamic amenorrhea recovery. If you're following along and you love the nutrition tips, you are going to love these as well. So make sure you stick around for all five. Now we're going to get straight into it with our first tip, which I'm going to let Elise take away. We're both so passionate about the exercise side of things, (laughs) both being exercise scientists, exercise physiologists. So hopefully we don't waffle on this one. (laughs) Oh, there's potential for it. Yeah. So the first tip we have for you today is cut out all vigorous or high intensity exercise. I think this one's really important and you may have heard this before. I know I've definitely, definitely heard it before, is that your body really can't tell the difference between running from danger and like running on a treadmill or doing a high intensity interval class or something like that. The physiological response that happens in your body is the same and that is stress. Not to mention that these types of exercise classes or routines or plans or whatever it might be also take away from that energy availability that we spoke about in the last episode when we shared the nutrition tips and how really it's really important to actually make sure that you have that reserve of energy Mm. and make sure that we're not expending it too much yeah and I think people are often really curious as to what high intensity or vigorous activity is Mm. um and there are many different kinds I think most people associate things like running or doing a HIIT class Mm. as a very vigorous form of exercise but it's also things like weight training which if you're doing at a, at a high level or even at a moderate level, let's be honest, can really take away from that energy availability and can also add to the stress of your body. So even though it's really, really hard, it's really important to, you know, press pause on these mm-hmm. kinds of activities. I think that's something to really hold on to is like it can feel like your whole life is falling apart when you don't get to do the things that you really enjoy doing. But I always say, and we always say to our clients, it's it's not for forever. This is a pause because it's, you know, you can get back to doing the kinds of activities that you love. And we love, yeah. we love movement. We love exercise, but we also love helping you choose what's appropriate for you for the season of your of the life that you're in and during your recovery season you need to change the kinds of exercise you're doing so yeah things like running high intensity interval training you know we can name some chain so maybe some chain gym type (coughs) workouts no we can't that might run some challenges from time to time but I may have worked at once yeah maybe stay away from those not as appropriate um so that would be the first main tip and you explained it so well that physiological response is really not helping your body on that physiological level to recover replenish your hormones and get back to a regular menstrual cycle Mm. um so the next tip we are focusing on in terms of improving your relationship with exercise to support your hypothalamic amenorrhea recovery is to take off your fitness watch now there's nothing inherently problematic about technology or fitness watch or smart watch in general but I think if you are caught in some kind of rigid routines and some belief systems about the amounts the kinds of exercise that you should be hitting day to day it can be that constant reminder that you're not getting there And I think one of what we hear this all the time, one of the biggest things people hold on to is how many steps. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Trying to hit that 10,000 step mark or 
more even, I think it's really interesting that the 10,000 step isn't really backed by a no. lot of science. It actually was, I'm not going to get the year right, but yeah, it was after Tokyo, the Tokyo Olympics. Olympics. Yeah, yeah, it was a kind of a sales gimmick to sell the new step pedometer. It was the first, I think it was actually the first pedometer that got released. Maybe mm. I'm wrong with that. But yeah, they called it a name that translated into 10,000 steps meter. Now, we do have some research around beneficial amounts Mm. of movement for different populations and different ages that correlate to a certain number of steps per day. But I think the more important thing is like to provide context around, well, why am I comparing myself to that amount for a different health condition that I don't have, right? So really, we need to be looking about like what is the most supportive amount of movement for you at this moment in time during your recovery journey towards restoring your periods. And it is kind of a little bit slower, a little bit less, but that's because your body is trying to recover from doing a bit too much. Yeah. Years of probably doing a bit too much. Yeah. Now taking off your fitness watch cold turkey, Mm can be a little bit of a challenge. Were you someone that had a fitness watch while we were going through this? Yeah. That watch that I just took off, I actually was gifted that for my birthday a month before I started my recovery. So it was brand new, shiny. I was so excited to have an Apple watch. I didn't quite go cold turkey, but what I did do is I I muted all of the notifications from the fitness app. So Mm. it wasn't telling me to stand up every hour and it wasn't telling me you're almost there, Elise, you've got this burn X amount of calories and whatnot. Not to mention it's not incredibly accurate when it does that kind of tracking. So my go-to was to mute it to the point where I actually would just forget to put it back on again Mm. and slowly kind of tape it away from using it to the fact that I didn't use it for about six months yeah I put it back on one day and I was like oh there you go had a different relationship with it yeah yeah because you can go back to wearing it Mm. and and using those metrics you know ad hoc or as you see fit when you have that better relationship with exercise it doesn't feel like it's that compulsive compelling I must I have to kind of mentality yeah and if you don't think that you can go cold turkey start with one day, start with a couple of hours. I often tell people, you know, like have a point in the day where you just take it off, like before you have dinner and start there. And maybe then it's after you have lunch and start there and you can build upon that. And obviously having tools and tips and support from my coach can be really beneficial in, in achieving that goal. Um, the next tip, one of my favorites, mm-hmm. one of our favorites. Definitely. Why don't you jump on yeah, this one? Yeah, absolutely, because I've got personal experience with this. Uh, so the next tip we have is not all yoga and Pilates are created equal. I think that's really important because I know for myself it was high-intensity, like heavy weightlifting sessions prior to recovery, and then it was gentle walks and yoga and Pilates. That's mm. kind of what I switched to initially, and then I kind of realized that The mentality, A, was still the same and it was still very rigid around exercise, but the types of yoga and Pilates I was choosing to do weren't gentle and restorative. They were very, very full on. Um, And I think we kind of can, what's the word? We can kind of You fall into this trap. Yeah, Yeah. and we can justify it in our head because, oh, well, I'm only doing Pilates or I'm only doing yoga. And I think it's also because we hear about, you know, other people's experiences of going, oh, well, I'm not allowed to do high intensity exercise, but yoga and Pilates, that's just like stretching. It's just stretching. And it absolutely is not. I remember uh, Elise came here to do a co-working day. I knew this was going to come up. Maybe like late last year. And I was like, oh, we're going to just have like a nice morning together. We're going to go do a reformer class. And anytime anybody ever tells me, Oh, I just do reformer now. I have that like little me too now switch in the back of my mind that goes, oh, okay, well, I'm going to ask them exactly what that reformer class is like because we went to a reformer class together. It was full on. It was full on. There were no breaks involved. Uh, you know, it's quite a strong class. You spend 50 minutes of, of moving mm-hmm. and it's wonderful and it's perfect for a person that has regular menstrual cycles, that's well fueled. Yeah that has variety and and rest days kind of built into their training week, 
But if your body's still stressed and then you have low energy availability, you're going to this kind of class or even doing a YouTube workout mm. where it's kind of like hit Pilates or power yoga, that is actually not going to serve you as much as you think it will. It might be a good stepping stone. Yeah, I think absolutely. that's really helpful. But you need to be able to get to a point where you can do nothing in a day, have an actual rest day and, and feel comfortable enough to take that on board and also see benefit in doing more mild, gentler forms of movement as still valid, as still yeah. useful, as still really beneficial for your mental well-being and your physical well-being at this point in your life while you are in recovery. Yeah. So just keep that in the back of your head. If you're wondering whether, oh my gosh, is this workout too intense for me? Um, a good kind of marker is to ask yourself, like, I don't know, would my mum who hasn't done any formal exercise in kind of five, six years, would she be able to keep up with it? Mm. Um, you just want to kind of be able to have a conversation like we're having yeah. while doing the movement and not feel like you couldn't keep that up. I also think if you're contemplating whether or not the particular movement or exercise class, sorry, is too much, it might be an indicator that it is too much. Maybe it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think that kind of feeds nicely into our next one. Mm. Our next tip is to, and this is going to be controversial, I feel like, stop using, I just want to improve my bone health or um, I need to make sure that my bones stay strong as an excuse to continue weight training or doing load bearing activities. Now, unless someone in your treatment team has specifically prescribed you a specific kind of training mm -hmm. regime based on your own personal circumstances, then not having enough estrogen in your body, i.e. when you have hypothalamic amenorrhea, is going to be worse for your bone health than continuing with your weight training because it's simply going to be prolonging the process of restoring the adequate estrogen, which will be not only bone protective, but cardio protective as well. Estrogen, estrogen is so important for our heart health. And I think so many people get caught up in this trap of like, oh, but if I'm not doing this, then I'm making my health worse. But actually trying to like zoom out and look at the bigger picture of going, well, what is actually making your health worse right now? Yeah, absolutely. While strength training and weight bearing exercise is really healthy for your bones, having a regular menstrual cycle is healthier. Yeah. And we guide people straight back into a level of exercise after they have recovered that is so beneficial for bone health, yeah. which we think is really important to do. So progressive overload, you know, making sure that you're getting those big compound movements in, there is a time and a place for that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not quite recovery. Not quite recovery. No. So Hopefully those tips that we went through today were really helpful for you. I'm just going to make sure that we got all of them because I think we might be missing one of them. We, and we are. We went really quick. Bonus tip. Bonus tip. Bonus tip. When we're talking about exercise, do you want to do the lucky last yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely, because I do really like this tip. It's redefining how you view rest. I know in my own personal experience, if I was resting, I was quote-unquote lazy. It was unproductive. But when I was kind of forced to rest more during recovery, I actually started to see it as an opportunity to be more productive in the long run. You know, mm -hmm. you can't, even the people you look up to and admire and you think that they just go, 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 and they are so successful, even they rest, mm -hmm. you know. And in recovery, it is really important to give your body more rest and to listen to those resting cues because it needs it. Yeah. You know, it's just like... You know, I always kind of use the comparison with like puppies or babies. When they're younger, all they do is eat and sleep. And mm -hmm. that's because all of these processes and growth and development are happening internally that you don't see. And that's very similar to recoveries. Yeah. All the energy that you're putting into your body by eating more is is going to restoring these internal processes. Yeah. And again, it's hard because you can't visually see it, but your body's working really hard and it needs that rest. Yeah. And, and using that time where you are kind of slowing down to explore mm. things that have fallen out of your life when food and exercise took Absolutely. over everything. I think, oh, hello. He's going to be our, our perfect rest kind of yeah. example here. But allowing yourself to lie on the couch and watch your favorite episode or movie of mm. something 
reading a book, seeing value in doing things that aren't necessarily moving or cleaning or, you know, being productive. I think, especially if you're following a lot of kind of like fitness influencers online and you're not viewing what is very necessary rest, it can really warp your perception of what, you know, a regular training schedule should be like. Um, so learning to slow down, learning to really reintegrate things into your life that are still so valuable, but allow your body to use all the energy that you're giving it to re-optimize, you know, all of your bodily processes that got down-regulated during that low energy availability and hypothalamic amenorrhea. You'll come out the other side still having a great mindset around kind of going, well, when I get back to, to doing the movement that I love, in order to keep this, I still have to value the slowness yeah. and see that as such a beneficial part of the training that I do in yeah. my life. So. Absolutely. I think a really important thing to touch on, and I know we've got an episode on this as well that we can link, but is that when you start to give your body more rest, you might actually start to feel more really tired, tired. Yeah. and it feels really counterproductive because you're like I'm resting more I'm giving my body more energy why do I feel like I've been hit by a bus yeah um, and it's completely part of the process um to a certain degree obviously but we'll definitely link that yeah podcast episode because I think that's important because it can feel really overwhelming and confronting when you're starting to rest more and you feel like it's still not enough yeah and look, it's not for forever, but we will link to that episode that kind of normalizes and explains why yeah. feeling more fatigued can be a, a big part of what happens when you actually start to slow down a little bit more. So in total, those are now our five top tips for exercise when you are working towards hypothalamic amenorrhea recovery. If you really enjoyed watching this episode and you are on YouTube, feel free to give it a thumbs up write a comment. Be sure to subscribe if you are listening to this podcast episode on your favorite podcast platform. And you can leave a five-star rating and review. It really helps support the show and helps more people find this amazing free resource. And if you're someone looking for support on your hypothalamic amenorrhea recovery journey, be sure to join the newsletter and download our free HA recovery checklist, which gives you everything that you need to be checking off to make sure that your period recovery is a lot faster and easier than doing it all on your own. Otherwise, that's today's episode and we will be back next week with a fresh new episode to wrap your ears and your eyes around.